manufactured in large numbers during the Second World War. In the early years of the war, the Allies depended heavily on the P-40 to gain control of the skies. During the dark days of 1940 and 41, the P-40's lethal firepower brought hope to the Allies and announced to the enemy that victory would not come easily. The P-40's technical performance was often no match for its adversaries. But the shortcomings of this durable and powerful fighter did not prevent it from becoming one of the deadliest aircraft of the war. With its trademark shark-toothed snarl, the P-40 prowled the skies over Europe, China, North Africa and the South Pacific. The aircraft's superior durability, diving abilities and firepower gave its pilots the advantage over their enemy. German and Japanese pilots quickly learned to respect the plane's strength and to fear its 650 caliber guns. Known as the Tomahawk, the Warhawk, and the Kitty Hawk, several variations of the P-40 comprise the first line of Allied fighters on numerous battlefronts. A staggering 13,000 P-40s flew into action in nearly every theater of the war. In Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, the Far East, Russia, the Aleutian Islands, and the Pacific, the P-40 delivered its punishing blows. Nowhere did the P-40 make a bigger mark than in China. For years, the Japanese had conducted massive bombing raids on Chinese cities with no opposition. But that all changed in December 1941. Under the leadership of General Claire Chenault, 100 shark-mouth P-40s flown by volunteer American pilots fighting under the Chinese flag began their brave resistance. Using Chenault's aerial tactics, the underdog P-40s dealt Japan's flying forces a series of devastating blows. By January 1942, a small group of American pilots were holding off the mighty Japanese in the skies over Burma. The Chinese dubbed them the Flying Tigers. These men, and the P-40s they flew, went on to become one of the greatest legends of the Second World War. The P-40 was a rugged and powerful design and was available in huge numbers when the Allies were in desperate need of fighter aircraft. With guns blazing, the deadly P-40 blew away its lightweight enemies, kept its pilots safe, and ensured the Allied air forces would live to fight another day. During the early years of the Second World War, the outlook was bleak for the Allied nations. In Europe, the onslaught of the German military and its legendary Luftwaffe appeared unstoppable. As one country after another fell under Nazi control, it seemed only a matter of time before Britain would be facing the German war machine alone. In China and the South Pacific, Japanese forces dominated the fighting. The United States realized that its stance of neutrality could not last forever. The need for arms and other material would be vital 
Great Britain and France needed weapons as well, and needed them quickly. Fighter planes were of the highest priority. In 1938, the frontline US fighter was the P-36. Designed by engineer Donovan Perlin for the Curtis Wright Corporation, the agile but lightly armed P-36 fighter was of metal construction and featured retractable landing gear and a radial air-cooled engine. Curtis won a production contract for 210 P-36 aircraft in 1937, the largest U.S. Army aircraft contract awarded since the First World War. But as the P-36 was rolling off factory lines in the United States in the late 1930s, designs for fighter aircraft around the world were advancing rapidly. England and France used the P-36 in combat over Europe in 1939 and 1940, but it was soon apparent that the aircraft was no match for newer European designs, in particular its main adversaries, the Focke-Wulf 190 and the Messerschmitt 109. As a result, the Army Air Corps issued specifications for a new pursuit aircraft in January 1939 preference would be given to a design that could be built quickly. Among the contenders were the Lockheed XP-38, the Bell XP-39, and two entries from Seversky Republic. The Curtis Wright Corporation, desperate to win a bid after a string of failures, submitted three designs, one of which was designated the XP-40. The first XP-40 was simply a P-36A with its Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp radial engine replaced by a supercharged Allison V-1710 V-12. The liquid-cooled Allison offered no more power than the radial engine, but its smaller frontal area led to considerably lower drag. The XP-40 first flew on the 14th of October, 1938. Army Air Corps leaders evaluated the aircraft at Wright Field in Ohio in 1939, along with several other fighter prototypes. After some modifications, the XP-40 won the competition. Curtis received a massive order for 540 aircraft at a cost of almost $13 million. The contract with Curtis sent the competing companies into uproar. They believed the XP-40 was already outdated since much of it was based on the older design of the P-36, but the Army wanted a sure-fire design. The twin-engine XP-38 was too radical to be a certain success and was not designed for quick mass production. The XP-38 did not help its cause when the prototype crashed during testing. In addition, the P-38 was designed as a high-altitude interceptor. The Army at the time did not foresee the need for great numbers of high-altitude fighters, believing that a fighter's main role was ground support. Although the XP-40 could not match the performance of some of its competition, especially at altitude, the aircraft was less expensive to manufacture and could reach mass production a full year ahead of the other machines. With the Axis powers dominating the battles overseas, the P-40 could not arrive soon enough. The P-40 fighter was the last of the famous Hawk line of aircraft produced by Curtis throughout the 1930s and 40s and shared several design elements with its predecessors. In fact, the P-36 and P-40 appeared virtually the same. The major change being the addition of the inline engine in the P-40. Before the P-40, designer Donovan Berlin had attempted to improve the P-36 by redesigning it 
to accommodate a turbo-supercharged Allison inline liquid-cooled engine. The new aircraft, designated the XP-37, was unpopular with pilots. But Curtis and Berlin stayed with their plans and were eventually able to replace the P-36's Pratt & Whitney R-1830 twin-wasp air-cooled radial engine with the Allison V-1710 B-12 liquid-cooled engine. From this angle, you can see the major difference between the P-36 and the P-40. Uh, the Curtis basically took the 10th production P-36 with the radial engine right here, removed it, and replaced that with the V-1710 inline engine to become the XP-40, which of course later became the production P-40. There'd be two uh, great advantages that Curtis had by just re-engining a P-36. By just re-engining the aircraft, they were able to get into production much faster than if they had started with a new airframe from scratch. It eliminated a lot of the teething problems, plus they already had the P-36 in production, so they had jigs and mold and, and things of that nature, but also made the aircraft cheaper. And in fact, the P-40 was one of the least expensive American fighters during World War II. The Allison V-12 was built by a division of General Motors and allowed a smaller frontal region than the radial engines, resulting in better streamlining and reduced drag. The liquid-cooled inline engine also offered better fuel consumption than air-cooled radials of comparable power. Without a turbocharger, however, the rated altitude of the Allison engine was only some 3,500 meters, making combat above 4,500 meters impossible. It was an engine that wasn't designed for high altitude operation. It was more of a medium and low altitude because that's where the Air Corps thought the mission was. The United States did not believe it would be attacked by enemy bombers, so it felt that the airplanes that it had, uh, fighter airplanes it had, would be engaged in combat at relatively low, low altitudes, and that's why the specifications came out. Because the Allies did not foresee a great need for fighters capable of high altitude performance, Curtis presented the re-engined P-36 for consideration. The P-36 from this angle is an excellent illustration of its similarities with the P-40. Basically, if you look at the radial engine that's right behind me, if you replace that with a V-1710 engine, you have yourself a P-40. Uh, the landing gear is the same, the wings the same, the framing around the cockpit's the same, uh, essentially the same aircraft, just re-engined. Though there were more similarities than differences in the designs of the two aircraft, there were more changes for the P-40 than just the Allison engine. The liquid-cooled engine required systems such as coolant radiators and tanks not needed by an air-cooled engine. These systems, along with gun mountings, air induction systems, weight, balance and maintenance considerations had to be woven into the new design. Because the Allison did not have a turbocharger or an intercooler, the radiator was moved forward below the nose and the cowling was modified. This change had a major impact on airspeed. An early prototype version of the P-40 was the first American fighter capable of speeds greater than 483 kilometers an hour. Improvements were made to the radiator as well. As for firepower, the P-40 eventually became one of the most heavily armed fighters in the skies. Well, initially, the, there was a mix in the early P-40s of uh, rifle caliber, uh, 30 caliber machine guns, and 50 caliber machine guns. The Army Air Forces standardized the, on the M2 50 caliber machine gun, and what that means basically is that the round is a half inch. Uh, and the 50 caliber was an effective weapon, could fire pretty rapidly, and they progressively uh, upgunned the P-40 to, uh, to where we have the P-40E behind me, which had six 50 caliber machine guns. The P-40 was a relatively clean design and was unusual for its time in having a fully retractable tail wheel. The first production version of the P-40 appeared in May 1940. By September, over 200 were delivered to the Army Air Corps. 185 more were delivered to Britain in the autumn and were designated the Tomahawk Mark I. 
Well, the P-40 is the greatest asset was that it was available. The, it had been in production and there were enough of them that they could supply them in small amounts to Great Britain and to the AVG and to other places. Uh, had P Curtis not created the P-40 and had it not been in production, we'd really been in sad shape because we didn't have any other airplane that was in any way comparable. As soon as the P-40 arrived overseas, it found itself outmatched by enemy fighters. But with combat experience gained, Curtis made many modifications that kept the P-40 in battle. Engineers added armor plating, better self-sealing fuel tanks, and more powerful engines. They modified the cockpit to improve visibility and changed the armament package to six wing-mounted 50 caliber machine guns. The P-40E Kitty Hawk was the first model with this gun package, and it entered service in time to serve with the Flying Tigers in China. The last mass-produced model was the P-40N. It was the lightest P-40 built in quantity and much faster than previous models. Several Allied Air Forces welcomed the powerful P-40 into service. In addition to being the frontline fighter of the United States, 27 other nations flew the P-40 during the war. Following its acceptance by the U.S. Army Air Corps in 1940, the P-40 was quickly assembled and sent to several American air bases. The British Commonwealth took 930 aircraft, issuing them to 16 squadrons. France ordered 140, but surrendered to Germany before the planes had left the factory. These aircraft were then diverted to British service. The main strength of the P-40, over and above everything else, was its availability. It had many weaknesses, including the lack of a turbo supercharger. It didn't have some advanced features that other aircraft had, like automatic slats, which made the aircraft more maneuverable at slower speeds. Uh, but it was available in great numbers. And the first year or so of the war, it, along with the P-39, was the main defense against the uh, Axis, uh, Axis air power. ...into a short lecture and let you know what's going on up the front. In Europe, British and later American airmen flew the P-40 against the legendary Messerschmitt 109. The young pilots learned at mission briefings that they were in for a tough fight. But scores of pilots from several countries were prepared to take the P-40 into battle. There was a cadre of pilots ready so that when the P-40 came in, they, they transitioned into it readily. It was uh, uh, not an exceptionally difficult airplane to fly. It had nice handling characteristics, but the pilots, the initial groups of pilots that flew it, were well experienced. The German aircraft they were about to encounter were more maneuverable and had a considerably faster rate of climb than the P-40. Attempting to escape the enemy by climbing would prove futile. Nevertheless, superior armor and deadly firepower made the Tomahawk a force to be reckoned with. On the European continent, P-40s found their greatest success in battles over Italy. There, P-40s flown by the 325th Fighter Group, commonly known as the Checker-Tailed Clan, battled German fighters throughout the summer of 1943. In fierce fighting, the P-40 helped gain control of the skies in preparation for advancing Allied ground operations. In addition to its role as a frontline fighter 
the P-40 was utilized as a deadly dive bomber. The P-40 could carry up to three 500-pound bombs attached to hard points on the aircraft. Targets in Europe, China and the Pacific were destroyed by its powerful bombing. While the bombs and bullets of the P-40 wreaked havoc on the Axis powers, the American-built fighter also took its share of hits. The P-40 proved a dependable aircraft, one that was capable of receiving heavy damage during battle and yet able to bring its pilot home safely. The P-40 was perhaps most valuable in the deserts of North Africa, where many British tomahawks were sent to lend a hand to the Hawker Hurricanes. Here, high altitude performance mattered less, and the P-40's rugged airframe, heavy armament and good range made it a deadly fighter. In North Africa, the combat was uh, uh, favorable to P-40 for two reasons. One is that it was at low altitude, which was its milieu. It, it had the engine to perform at low altitudes. And two, a lot of the opposition was uh, uh, Italian aircraft, which were uh, less ca capable than the P-40. Now, the Italian pilots were good, but they were not comparable, uh, that weren't equipped with comparable equipment. The RAF, Royal Australian Air Force and the South African Air Force all flew P-40s as ground attack aircraft in support of the 8th Army in North Africa. The close air support is for troops in contact. So they would uh, basically, if, if troops are getting shot at by uh, opposing tanks or infantry, they would come in and direct, directly attack those targets. But a lot of the missions that the P-40s flew in North Africa were interdiction. Uh, one of the keys to the ground uh, war in North Africa was getting fuel supplies. Uh, it was essential. And if those fuel supplies or other uh, uh, war-making supplies could be interdicted or destroyed along the way, then if the tanks are at the front and they don't have weapon, and they don't have ammunition, they don't have fuel, then they can't fight. As the P-40 made a name for itself in North Africa as a ground attack aircraft and fighter bomber, the Allies were also gaining invaluable experience on how to best engage the German and Italian military machines. Experience that would be put to good use in future European operations. Thousands of pilots flew the P-40 in every theater of the war. Perhaps no aviators were more excited to fly the Curtis-built fighter than the men of the United States Army Air Corps 99th Fighter Squadron. Known as the Tuskegee Airmen, the men of the 99th were the first black pilots to fly under the nation's flag. For years, black Americans had fought for the right to serve in the Air Corps, the most elite branch of the military, the first training program for black pilots began at Tuskegee, Alabama in 1941. Men such as future four-star General Benjamin O. Davis trained long hours to prepare themselves for combat. On the 6th of March, 1942, the graduating pilots not only got their wings, they also prepared for battle in the cockpit of America's top fighter. That was the whole goal of many had aspired to be fighter pilots and to get a chance to get your silver wings of the Army Air Corps and climb in an aircraft was was uh, that was the goal and very eager and and uh, and hopefully to uh, get into combat as soon as possible the Tuskegee airmen were first stationed at bases in North Africa from here the pilots would fly their first missions of the war low-level strafing and bombing attacks, for which the P-40 was well suited. They got brand new P-40s, 
when they uh, landed in Africa and uh, uh, began their combat. And, and the interdiction was, uh, well, they pushed the Germans out of North Africa, uh, really captured uh, Panelleria without even any U.S. forces or Allied forces landing on Panelleria, and then uh, uh, drove the Germans out of Sicily and moved up there uh, flying the P-40. Despite the success of the 99th flying low-level attack missions in the P-40, American military leaders appear determined to keep the black pilots away from air-to-air -air combat. That changed in 1943, when the Tuskegee Airmen began flying missions alongside the white pilots of the 79th Fighter Group on patrols over the Italian coastline. The P-40s were to provide protection for the Allied naval forces, establishing a beachhead below. The Germans, however, attempted to push back the invading forces. As 12 P-40s patrolled at 3,500 meters, 24 aircraft of the Luftwaffe sped downwards to meet them. For the Tuskegee Airmen, the moment of truth had arrived. These pilots and their P-40s would not disappoint. During the first two weeks of operations, the Tuskegee Airmen downed 17 German aircraft, damaged eight more, and provided the protection needed by the landing forces below. At the controls of their P-40s, these pioneers proved that black pilots were as good as their white counterparts. The Curtis P-40 saw action on every front throughout the Second World War. It remained in service from the United States' entry into the war in 1941 until the end in 1945. But the P-40s will always be best remembered as the aircraft flown by Claire Lee Chenault's American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers. For centuries, China had remained isolated from world events. In 1937, Japanese bombers pounded the defenseless nation. Millions of Chinese perished in the attacks. Chiang Kai-shek desperately tried to assemble an air unit to defend his country from the invading Japanese. The Chinese leader knew he needed not only planes and pilots, but tactical expertise as well. He therefore turned to a brash aviator whose attitude and ideas had clashed with many in the United States military. In 1937, he appointed Claire Lee Chenault as his air advisor. Chenault had long believed that pilots flying from air bases in China could launch devastating surprise attacks against the Japanese. But for this, Chenault needed money, planes, and pilots. Money from China diverted an order placed by the British Royal Air Force for 100 Curtis Wright P-40B Tomahawks. But buying aircraft was only one important step. Well before the war reached America, President Franklin D. Roosevelt knew that the U.S. would eventually be drawn into the conflict. On the 15th of April, 1941, Roosevelt quietly signed an executive order permitting Chenault to recruit directly from the ranks of American military reserve pilots. Within a few months, Chenault had set up office and recruited 350 volunteers from pursuit, bomber, and patrol squadrons. These pilots were officially part of the Chinese Army, fighting for a salary of $500 a month and a bonus for each plane they brought down. In 
they were lured for various reasons. Uh, I think some of them were probably looking for adventure or were looking to get into the fight, not unlike some of the Americans who volunteered to fly with the RAF uh, in 1940 and 1941. Uh, some were perhaps lured by the, the money. Uh, there was a significant reward for shooting down a Japanese aircraft. But the AVG took quite a bit of time to get off the ground. Uh, they had to get over there. There were problems with the organization. Uh, when the uh, P-40s came over, they were not, some of them weren't equipped with sights. They had problems getting them armed. Um, but it can kind of be thought of as, as a, uh, something of a ragtag outfit. Chenault was disappointed by what he saw when his crack pilots arrived in China in 1940, and the pilots were dismayed by the primitive conditions in which they were to live and train. Chenault knew that many of these men had chosen to fight in China to avoid the standard military regime. Therefore, there would be few rules in the American volunteer group. Salutes were not required. Uniforms were chosen based on comfort and convenience. Discipline was left up to the men themselves. When it came to flying, though, these brash young men were second to none. Among Chenault's pilots were Second World War legends such as Tex Hill and Gregory Pappy Boyington, who later became the top ace of the war as the leader of the Black Sheep Squadron in the Pacific. The men of the AVG wanted the look of their planes to reflect their steely determination. Vicious fangs and teeth were painted on the noses of the AVG P-40s, giving the unit's fighters their signature ferocious appearance. The P-40 was referred to as the old crate by many in the US military, but Chenault knew how to get the most out of his planes and his pilots, even though only one in five of these men had ever flown the P-40 before. Chenault taught the basics in what he called his kindergarten. Pilots were drilled in the fighter tactics he developed over decades of flying and years of observing the Japanese. AVG pilots were taught to use the plane's strengths and exploit the enemy's weaknesses. Claire Chenault was very smart and he knew that the P-40 did not have a chance to outmaneuver either the Mitsubishi Zero, the A6M, or the Oscar, the, the Army uh, uh, fighter. And so he trained them that they should use the P-40 as a dive and zoom type airplane in which they would make a diving attack through a Japanese formation, fire, dive away, climb to altitude, and do it again, and never to attempt to maneuver with the Japanese airplanes. The primary goal of the AVG and their P-40s was the defense of both ends of the Burma Road the only route from which China could receive supplies over land. In December 1941, after months of training, planning and battling the hot summer sun, the AVG and their P-40s were ready for action. The Japanese did not make them wait for long. On the 20th of December, the word came that Japanese bombers were approaching Kunming. For two years, they'd been bombing with no resistance. But that day was different. 24 P-40s headed into the skies for battle. The AVG destroyed three Japanese bombers in combat in one day. For the next two months, the AVG met the Japanese in the air at every opportunity. The Japanese still maintained a firm grip on the skies over China, but the AVG had sent a powerful warning during their first two months of spirited combat. The cities of Rangoon and Kunming were no longer unprotected. <laughs> 
the Chinese newspapers were the first to herald the AVG's victories and dubbed the men the Flying Tigers. After a series of disappointments and defeats at Pearl Harbor, Guam, Wake Island and Hong Kong, Allied photographers, journalists and film crews were able to report the victories over the Japanese, raising the hopes of their countrymen. In early 1942, when they finally started engaging in combat against the uh, Japanese in China, the U.S. was just reeling from defeat after defeat after defeat, and the uh, Flying Tigers were flushed with, with success. And again, it's because of the, uh, the tactics of uh, Claire Chennault. Again and again, the Japanese arrived over China, only to be met by the Flying Tigers, which continued to practice Chennault's air-to-air -air tactics. Engage the enemy in pairs, Use the P-40's superior dive speed to hit and run. Avoid the urge to enter uncontrolled dogfights. And never try to turn with the Japanese aircraft. This constant fighting made for weary pilots and bullet-ridden aircraft. The Tigers could often send up no more than 10 P-40s to challenge the dozens of invading Japanese planes. The AVG was forced to give some ground to the Japanese, but the Tigers had not been defeated in the air. Supplies from the Allied powers continued to make their way up the Burma Road to China. Both the general and Madame Chiang Kai-shek were heartened by the fighting spirit of the AVG. Madame even took to calling the pilots her boys and with true appreciation declared to the men that the whole of the Chinese nation has taken you to its heart. From December 1941 to February 1942, the Japanese launched several air attacks on China and the AVG. Chenault had anticipated the waves of enemy aircraft and devised a simple but effective warning system. Chinese citizens and towns across the countryside served as spotters. When they saw or heard approaching aircraft, they radioed the news back to AVG headquarters, which in Kunming was located in a nearby cave. Inside, the AVG tried to make sense of the various reports coming in from their spotters across the countryside. From the position of their base on the map, the AVG drew concentric circles out to about 300 kilometers. As reports of sightings of approaching Japanese aircraft were received from the small villages dotting the countryside, a flag was placed on each location. When the flags formed a straight line, the alert announced that the Japanese were on their way. And two or three plots would give a course because the Japanese were unaware that they were being plotted and there was no reason for them to do any deceptive measures. And so it wasn't radar by any means, but it was almost as effective and, and far more effective than anybody would have imagined. The alert warning sent the pilots scrambling to their awaiting aircraft. Climbing into the signature P-40s, the men prepared themselves for battle. On the morning of the 23rd of December, 1941, the attacking Japanese had their sights set on Rangoon shipping docks and the AVG's airfield. 
the AVG raced into the sky, sending up 24 P-40s against more than 120 enemy aircraft. The Japanese had learned from earlier losses and now had fighter planes escorting their bombers. Fire from the deadly 50mm guns of the sharp-nosed P-40s ripped through the winter skies. In fierce fighting, the pilots of the AVG engaged swarms of Japanese planes. Though the lightweight Japanese fighters flew circles around their P-40s, Chenault's Flying Tigers were not completely outmatched. Zero and the Oscar were far more maneuverable than the P-40, and, and uh, even if the pilots were equal, it, it would not be an equal contest because you could, the P-40 couldn't stay with them. On the other hand, the, the Zero could not stay with the P-40 in a dive, and certainly the Zero and the Oscar didn't have the structure to stand up to the P-40's firepower. It had uh, uh, six uh, 50 caliber machine guns, and they were threw a lot of uh, lead and firepower out and would shatter the uh, structure of, of the uh, of fighters, uh, enemy fighters. The speed of the P-40 and the flying skills of the Tigers were not always enough to avoid disaster against a worthy opponent. Even when the Tigers had a good day of combat, some bombers would slip through to pound their targets. Nineteen American pilots lost their lives while flying for the Chinese. Five more were captured or listed as missing in action. But the losses experienced by the Flying Tigers were far less than the destruction they inflicted on the Japanese. Losing only four P-40s in combat, the men of the AVG destroyed 286 enemy aircraft. At the hands of the Flying Tigers, the P-40 truly became one of the war's deadliest aircraft. Though outgunned and undermanned, the Flying Tigers destroyed almost 300 Japanese aircraft and earned the respect and gratitude of the Chinese. Yet their own American military showed little support for the Flying Tigers. Many U.S. officials were fed up with the popularity of these renegade pilots. On the 4th of July, 1942, the AVG contracts expired and the group that had single-handedly defended the skies over China was disbanded. <laughs> 